This is CPSC 526, 626, a continuation of the network layers lecture and appendix with an attack on DHCP and then an example of why IP-based protocols are inherently spoofable. So when we bootstrap a connection to the internet, meaning we, we just connect, we start with a machine that's not connected to the internet and attempt to connect to the internet. We don't have an IP address. That is, when you first turn on your computer and you plug it into a router or you try to connect to Wi-Fi, you don't actually have an IP address. And the question is, what IP should you use? You have to use this IP in order to get packets. You can, In order to get packets be received to you, when you send them out, you need to include your source IP address. But you really don't know what it ought to be, even. if Unless you looked at your IP address, you probably have no intuition why it looks the way it, it does. This would be particularly true for your external IP address, the one given to you by your ISP. But even for just the devices around in your house, they'll have a, a local IP address, usually the form 192.168.something.something. But where do those somethings come from? Why does one get assigned 102 and another get assigned 103? Not only that, you don't even know who to ask necessarily for an IP address. I mean, in theory, you would ask the router or your ISP. You'd say, oh, yeah, I would like an IP address, please. But you don't actually know who that is. There's, you could have a standard, you could say 192.168.1.1 is the router, but there, there's no guarantee that's always going to be obeyed. And it certainly wouldn't be true if you're just connecting out to your ISP and asking them what I, IP address to use. So for configuring hosts in a local subnet, the dynamic host configuration protocol, DHCP, is used. And this is a protocol that you would have used frequently anytime you've ever connected a device onto a local network. This is happening behind the scenes transparently. And it solves an important purpose, which is to not have to manually configure IP addresses on all of your devices and requiring a sysadmin to tell you what those ought to be. Instead, they're happening dynamically. So the idea with DHCP is that the host broadcasts a server discovery message. This is happening at the link layer. So link layer, that means devices that can directly communicate to each other. So it's not an IP packet. It's just a server discovery message being broadcasted out to the local subnet, which basically says, does anyone know what basic configuration I should use? And then the server replies, or possibly more than one server replies, or possibly a server and possibly an Eve replies offering information about how to configure your device, what your IP address should be, and so forth. So the premise of the DHCP, a new client goes to the DHCP server and gives this DHCP discovery a broadcast message. The DHCP server then replies again to the, to the client with an offer. And the DHCP offer contains an IP. Here's your IP you can use. No one else is using it. DNS information, and we're going to talk about DNS and attacks on DNS soon, but DNS is what translates things like google.com into an IP address. So if, if you have a bad DNS that's giving you bad IP addresses, you're basically able, an, an attacker could put themselves on path anywhere. So you might start thinking that Eve is where google.com is instead of actually where google.com is. So if you have a bad DNS, it allows you to get on path to do a lot of these other attacks. It also tells you the gateway router. The gateway is the router that you talk to in order to escape your subnet, in order to get your packets out to the big internet. So the gateway is also going to be on path for any data that you send out of the network. So you're going to want to make sure you have a good gateway as well, because if the gateway is Eve, then Eve is going to be on path for all of your internet traffic. So the DNS resolves host names. And the gateway is the effectively the first hop out to the internet. Then the new client replies back to the DHCP server 
DHCP request. Again, it's a broadcast. So at this point, the DHCP client has looked at the offer that was made by the server, decided I like this offer, and tells the server, Let's, I'll take it. The DHCP server tells then the new client, I acknowledge that you accepted this offer. So the first two says, what configuration do I use? Then comes the answer. Then the client says, okay, I like that configuration. And the server says, I like that you like it. So now I'll show this to you, but with actual packets. So let's take a look. So here, again, you can find this on cloudshark.org. It's one of the captures they have. It's a simple DHCP connection. You can see here, the destination is broadcast. Now, these are MAC addresses. MAC addresses are used at the link layer, and we'll have a lecture on this topic as well when we talk about ARP and ARP spoofing attacks. But you can, the metaphor of MAC addresses being the link layer equivalent of IP addresses is a reasonable way of thinking about it. Every piece of physical networking hardware has a unique MAC address. This is the responsibility of factories Every manufacturer has its own range of numbers that they include, and then they're responsible to never send out two devices with the same MAC address. And this allows them to be globally unique for the purposes of uh, communicating. They differ from IP addresses in that IP addresses contain routing information. IP addresses help tell you where to send a packet to, of course, a MAC address does nothing like that. It tells you this is a Samsung device or this is a Lenovo device, this sort of thing. It doesn't tell you where it might be physically located. Anyhow, when the MAC address of all binary ones appears, this FF colon FF, so forth, that means it's a broadcast. It means that this is being sent from this MAC address device to all devices that can hear it, everyone when um, when a device sees this as the destination, it concludes this one must be for me. I, I'm, res I'm supposed to look at this packet. It may not be relevant to them, but they'll consider it and see if it is. You see, for the IP part of the packet, the source IP is blank, all zeros. The destination is all ones. Again, indicating that this device does not know what its configuration is. Then, it's a UDP packet, source port 68, destination port 67. And what does it actually say? Here is, as you can see on the right, the bootstrap message is where most of the data is occurring. So. Message type, a request. All of the information about the IP addresses, these are all empty. Here's my MAC address, and it doesn't know anything about what's happening. It would like to have a default configuration. The server, 192.168.0.10, then or sorry, rather, 192.168.0.1, the server, then replies, giving it the option of having .0.10 as its IP address. So here we have a reply, and in this reply, we've now said, here's your IP address. Here's the IP address that you should be using when you're doing your communication. And if the client likes it, which it appeared to, it then sends its reply as a request. So the first, DHCP discover, DHCP offer, DHCP request, and then the final one, the ACK. It's saying, yes, I would like to accept your generous offer of an IP address. And finally, 
the reply to that, I acknowledge your your acceptance of this. Now what's nice about TCB dump and Wireshark, these tools, is that you can do this on your own. So you can run TCP dump on your machine and then run the tool DHC client or DH client rather and then specify the interface that you want to get a new DHCP configuration for, such as WLAN 0 if you're using your Wi-Fi, or ETH 0 if you're connected with Ethernet. And by using TCP dump, despite it being a UDP protocol, TCP dump will still capture it, and you'll be able to look at the actual sequence of messages between your machine and the router that are triggered exactly by you having done that. And so I encourage you to give that a try uh, if you have access to a Unix-based machine and, uh, and, and just investigate the packets themselves and, and sort of understand exactly what communication has just occurred, uh, especially with the contextualization that Wireshark provides. So what are some threats to the DHCP protocol? Well, first is that it's a broadcast protocol, meaning that any local attacker is in a race to reply. If Bob and Eve and the router are all nearby, Bob says to everybody, hey, what's a good IP address to use? And whatever reply he gets is probably what he'll use. And he has no way of telling that the reply came from a, a router in good standing or Eve. I mean, in principle, Bob could look at the IP or the MAC address of the, the person who replied and see that, oh, this is a MAC address not of a router but of a, a commodity laptop, so it's not likely to be who should be giving me internet configurations. But despite that, there's no reason that the attacker couldn't also lie about the MAC address and make it look like a nice router. And second, nothing in the DHCP protocol will actually check to make sure that the MAC address belongs to something that's eligible to be giving out DHCP offers. So anyone can reply to these requests. Then you, give, you can give a bad DNS server, you can give bad configurations, you can give a bad gateway, which puts the attacker on path thenceforth. If once you're on path, as we talked about, there's a lot more you can do. You can trivially man in the middle to do packet capture. You can modify traffic. You're not blind. You see what the traffic actually is. And of course, the victim has no idea it's happening. Any DHCP offer is going to look legitimate. And if multiple happen at the same time, it's nothing that would trigger an alarm bell. For instance, when your phone is connecting to a Wi-Fi hotspot, there could be repeaters. There could be multiple Wi-Fi hotspots, and certainly would be the case in any large organization where there's a large physical space that you're trying to connect and to the same network. So it's quite probable in that kind of a setting that you would get multiple offers. And there's nothing intrinsically suspicious about that. But what this attack on DHCP shows that's quite interesting is two aspects of security. First, that these broadcast protocols are inherently at risk of these local attacker spoofing. Because any sort of a broadcast protocol implicitly places any nearby adversary on path and non-blind. Or eligible, not necessarily on path, I suppose, but eligible to reply. Eligible to look, make a reply that would be indistinguishable from the legitimate reply. But the second is that DHCP is a bootstrapping protocol. And when... Doing an initialization when booting up a system, in this case connecting it to the internet, 
Systems are particularly vulnerable. It's the same idea where we need an authenticated channel in order to create a secure channel. By having a, an authentic channel, we can do a Diffie-Hellman key exchange and turn it into a secure channel. But if we don't have an authentic channel, we can't create trust out of nowhere. And a similar sort of situation arises here in that... We want, we, we, at, when we have no information about what a valid DNS server is right now and what a decent network configuration is, we implicitly have to just trust what we hear. We have no way of knowing if what we're hearing is legitimate. This also nicely illustrates this trade off in security between convenience and security. I, it would be secure if. DHCP didn't exist. It would be massively inconvenient that every single person, whether or not they're particularly technically inclined, had to can manually configure their IP addresses and their DNS servers and their gateways. So this tension between security and convenience appears throughout. And DHCP is a particularly elegant, simple illustration of it, in that we want security, but much more importantly, we would much rather have DHCP, so that we don't have to deal with manually configuring IP addresses, even though that would be technically more secure. And finally, with DHCP attacks, you can have attacks happening to users, man-in-the-middle attacks, without any indication that they're occurring. Because if Eve is able to mislead Bob about the gateway, Bob will never realize that he has put Eve on path for all of his network traffic. And similarly, if Bob receives a bad DNS, he'll equally have no way of knowing that this is not the DNS that he should be using and will implicitly trust the replies he gets, even though they may be misleading. And just want to look at source address spoofing as the last thing that we'll consider here. And we're going to talk more in, when we talk about TCP attacks, we'll get into more details. But... At the network layer, when you're sending out a packet, you provide the source IP address. As we talked about before, there's no guarantee that this is actually the correct source IP address. There's no requirement that a computer specifies the correct one. Your operating system will because it wants the internet to work correctly. But if you open a raw socket, you can just specify your own. Now. If you change your IP address, the receiver will not be able to send you a reply. And as we see in the next lecture on denial of service attacks, sometimes that's actually the motivation. But you are able to provide a fake source IP address. So for instance, when you send a packet to an attacker, that or, or to a victim, rather, that does something bad, when they look at, oh, who sent me this packet? Well, they can't see it was you. Now, of course, many attacks are going to require two-way communication. It's not common that you can just send a packet to a machine and cause chaos, though that, that has been the case. But generally, you'll need to be having a two-way communication. So if you're doing blind, off-path IP address spoofing, you're probably not going to be able to do anything effectively. But if you're on path, or and you can see this traffic, you may be able to actually stop Alice's packets from getting through to Bob, while meanwhile sending Bob packets from yourself, claiming to be from Alice. The key of these IP addresses, these are just like return addresses on an envelope. 
you can write whatever return address you want. If you don't want to, for instance, pay for postage, you could use the return address to be the person you actually want to write the letter to and then just drop it in the mailbox. I can't guarantee that it'll work, and you shouldn't do it, because that's probably mail fraud, so I definitely think you should not do that. But nevertheless, assuming that you're living in the same general mail area as the recipient, the t policy is to return the un insufficiently postage to envelope back to the sender, but there's no guarantee that what's actually written in the top left corner is the legitimate sender. And in this case, it was a situation in the United States where uh, politicians were receiving anthrax and letters. They weren't actually letters from fourth grade schools, but they were anthrax. The attacker simply misled the recipient of this letter as to who it actually was from, simply by putting something other than the truth. Same works for IP addresses. You can set arbitrary destination addresses, arbitrary source addresses. You can enumerate through all possible destination addresses. This is known as scanning. It's a brute force search of an IP space. So if you know that, for instance, a company, all their IPs are of the form x.y.z.something, you can try to connect to x.y.z.1, x.y.z.2, and so forth. And maybe it's x.y.something.something, so now you have 256 times 256 possibilities. And you could do the same for the entire internet. It would take you some a long amount of time, and you would probably very quickly get stopped by your ISP who would disconnect you and then send you bad letters and tell you not to do that. And even the small amount of scanning, it's pretty detectable because the pattern is quite obvious when you're going from IP to IP to IP in a very short amount of time. So that usually gets angry letters really quickly. Another attack is you can send as many messages as possible. This is known as flooding. And it's a form of a denial of service attack, which is the topic of our next lecture. In general, IP, the protocol, has no general way of tracking overuse. There's no accounting of how many packets you're sending or a particular host is sending because there's no way of being certain that it's actually coming from them aside from your ISP monitoring the link between your house and the internet at large. There's no way for, for instance, Google.com to know how many packets a particular person sent them because they could lie about the source. And second, IP has no general way for tracking consent, meaning that if you're a computer connected to the internet and someone has your IP as the destination, you will receive that packet, assuming that nothing goes wrong with the internet. You can't opt out of receiving packets Aside from when you do receiving the, receive them, it just simply ignoring them. And so as a result, it's hard to detect where such a, a flood of spoofed packets is actually coming from. And we'll talk about that more in the next lecture.